Welcome to A4N, the Artificial Neural Network News Network, the show about the latest developments in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science, where we both introduce technical aspects of these advances, as well as discuss their social implications. In today's episode, we'll be covering how data and machine learning are applied to understand and eradicate viruses, including how you at home, without any experience with ML yourself, could help out. We'll also talk about mind-controlled prosthetic limbs that are facilitated by machine learning algorithms, and how today's AI startups are so wildly different from the software-as-a-service tech startups that venture capital firms have invested in historically. My name is John Crone. I have a Canadian accent and always use the word data as a plural term, so that's how you can distinguish my voice. I'm here with my co-hosts. Andrew Vlahuten. Uh I'm Grant Bailfeldt. I'm the one that sounds funny because I'm from across the country of the world. <laughs> and I'm Vince Pataccio, the other one. <laughs> Good. Um, thanks, guys. Um, let's get started. We're very lucky to have a special guest with us on today's show. That's Ben Taylor. So Ben Taylor was the chief data scientist at HireVue for four years. Ben, do you want to tell us quickly about what HireVue is and what you did there? Yeah, happy to. So HireVue, they, they were a pioneer company where they were the first company to do digital interviewing. So this is interviewing at home. On your, on your iPhone, on your laptop. And this sounds very normal today, but when they started 14 or 15 years ago, their customers would ask what, what a webcam was, which is laughable today. Wow. So they would actually mail a webcam. So if you wanted to go huh. interview for a mining company and you didn't have a webcam, HireVue would mail you a webcam and you would do this digital interview. So um, we did bring an AI component to what they do. We, it's called HireVue Insights where we use automatic speech recognition, raw audio analysis, and we build these holistic models that predict how well someone did on an interview. So they're performance models. Nice. Um, that's cool. And that is uh, nicely related, though coincidentally related, to um, to how on TAPS, so the rest of us on the show, all these co-hosts, we work also in, in human resources, uh, building models um, that automate recruiting. Um, so interesting overlap there. Um, and so more recently, you were also the co-founder of Zeph AI or Zeph.ai, an AI company. Um, first of all, how do you pronounce it properly? Um, and what did you guys specialize in at Zeph? Um, and I also hear you might have some exciting news for us. Yeah, so the it's Zeph. And there's there's a whole backstory to that. It used, it used to be called Ziff. And we had some legal pressure to change it. And so I actually hate Zeph, but we're <laughs> called, we're called Zeph because that was an easy change. Um, we focused on auto, auto ML, but around deep learning. So can we enable an engineer to build deep learning models with image, audio, video, and text? And the place we got to more, that was more exciting, it was this concept of fusion models. Can I have a single model that consumes video and audio, or multiple different types of images and text and structured. And so that's where we ended up building models like that for insurance, proctoring, um, just image classification, stuff like that. Nice. That sounds fascinating. And I have no doubt that you will have a lot to contribute to all of today's topics, um, uh, given your background. Uh, could I jump in a little on Zeph for just a second? Um, yeah. Considering that... Uh, my voice sounds funny because I'm from across the world. Um, in South Africa, Zef is actually a sort of a slang term, um, which kind of means, I guess it could be referred to as like kitsch. Um, it's like rooted in like 1980s style. So uh, you would describe someone's like clothing as really Zef if it was kind of <laughs> a little bit otherwise and, and interesting and different. Yeah, we, we, were, we were actually laughing about the South African Zef definition because it's essentially <laughs> white trash bling, uh -huh. right? That's, that's so it's a, like that's... we're poor but rich. Um, it, it, it's great. I think it fits us well. Exactly. <laughs> if, you were, if anyone's familiar with um, the Antwoord, the, the, that sort of strange South African band, that's uh, they sort of capitalized on like the Zeph movement. Got it. Thank you very much, Grant. That was super helpful. Um, <laughs> 
And then my last question for you before we start digging into our uh, content for today's podcast. Um, so Ben, uh, you were actually supposed to be in person with us last week, visiting from Utah, recording with us in New York. It was supposed to be all five of us in studio on camera so that we could, you know, stream to YouTube and people could check out the live raw feed. Uh, what happened? Is there something going on in the world? Yeah, my wife forced me to fly home from Boston on Thursday <laughs> last week because she was pissed. And she thought, like, New York was showing up in the news. So with Corona, yeah, my wife wasn't going to let me fly to New York last week. So, Yeah, and it ended up being, it was it was that exact timing. It was, that was the day, it was, it was that Friday that you were supposed to fly into New York and film with us. It was the first day that people started really not showing up for work. Um, you know, we, we're, we work in a, we work and we work in a, we work and it was really quiet that day. Things were definitely different and boy, has it been different since. So, um, we are actually, we, we are a new show and we are going to talk about, uh, the coronavirus, but we are going to take a different take on it. So a lot of what you see out there, even a lot of data that you see out there are related to the epidemiology of Corona. And we are going to sidestep that. We are going to talk about how um, data and machine learning are applied to study viruses, including the coronavirus, in order to help us build defenses against viruses. And as a lead into this topic, I have a really somber um, LinkedIn post from uh, Miriam Kakpur. So she is a PhD student in Iran who has been following my writing online for many years. We've corresponded um, probably a, a dozen times over the years. So she wrote on LinkedIn yesterday, <clears throat> Dear Dr. Crone, I used to read your article, and she's she's referring specifically to an article that I wrote um, called uh, We Live in the Most Peaceful Times Ever, which used data to show that um, conflict, uh, both on a large scale and a small scale, are, are down across the board, across the world. And so she said, I used to read your article, and seek consolation to help me condone the ugliness I see in this world. A few days ago, I saw my dad choking to death right in front of my eyes and died of COVID-19. Now that I see lots of people struggling with this unknown man-made virus and no scientists and no technology can help, how can I still be optimistic that we are living in the most peaceful times ever? So first of all, this is, it is absolutely tragic. And uh, my condolences for your loss, Miriam, that is awful. I can't even begin to imagine what that experience is like. And uh, no question, this must be an incredibly sensitive time for you. Um, I doubt there's anything I can, I can really say to help right now, but um, yeah. And especially these kinds of cold heart figures, but I, I do actually overall through the things that I've seen so far in the early stages, um, of this, um, of this pandemic, I, I actually still do believe that we live in, um, the most peaceful times in human history. Um, in fact, I think some, a lot of the ways that we've responded to the current pandemic only bolsters that case. So a great book for anyone to read about this, including you, Miriam, is, uh, Yuval Noah Harari's book, Homo Deus. So it's one of my favorite books of all time. And it goes into a lot of detail into how humans until the past century, had to accept war, famine, and disease as a natural part of life. And so while today war, famine, and disease still do impact us, the rates with which any of those three occur are down precipitously from centuries past. And for the first time in human history, it's possible to imagine, at least, a world where all three of these perennial issues are wiped out completely. So um, infectious diseases used to wipe out entire civilizations. When smallpox was brought from Europe to North America in the 17th century, it killed 80 to 90% of the native North American populations. Today, alongside many other once commonplace diseases, smallpox has been completely eradicated thanks to scientific advances like inoculations and public policy advances like quarantine. Uh, another example is the plague pandemic, which was known as the Black Death, um, which killed 30 to 60% of Europe's population in the 14th century. Today, the plague infects about 600 people a year only, and it's treatable with antibiotics. So um, infectious diseases, armed conflict, and malnutrition today, they account for only a small fraction of deaths relative to the most common causes, including cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So this means that in the past few decades, 
it has become more likely to die from overeating from a, a condition like cardiovascular disease or, or diabetes that is caused by overeating than from war, famine, and infectious diseases combined. Um, and, and, and it's getting better all the time on, on actually all of those fronts. So, you know, we're, we're beginning to tackle um, these obesity problems too, and, and war, famine, infectious diseases, these, these continue to become um, smaller problems now. So with the novel Corona outbreak today, um, there have been dramatic worldwide behavioral changes influenced by data-driven public policy, um, the rich scientific field of epidemiology, and the spread of at least some reliable information over the internet um, that means that countless of millions, countless millions of lives um, will no doubt be saved because of the way that we have adapted, adapted in just a matter of months as an entire civilization. And um, thanks to affordable mass-produced medicines, sanitary products, and medical technology like respirators, only a couple percent of those affected are likely to die, which is nevertheless horrific especially when it's somebody um, close to you, uh, you know, like a parent. And uh, yeah, so I, 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 can't, I can't imagine, uh, you know, how you must feel right now. It, it, it must be absolutely awful. And that's normal for you to feel that way. And I'm deeply sorry that you had to go through this experience. But I do hope that in time, you'll once again be optimistic, um, like you were until recently, that scientists and technology can and do help, including during the present outbreak, and that quantitatively, um, we not only live in the most peaceful times in human history, but that the outlook uh, is 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 even better for the generations that are to come. So, um, on the note of scientists and technology helping us understand and tackle viruses, we're lucky to have Dr. Grant Bellevelt as one of our co-hosts because he happens to have a PhD in virology, specifically in the application of large data sets to the study of viruses. So. Um, Grant, I've got some questions for you. Um, you have been talking a lot this week about something called CORD-19, C-O-R-D-19. What is that? What's CORD-19? Uh, yeah, John. Uh, so CORD-19 is a uh, data set that has been made available to the scientific world at large, uh, specifically re related to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is uh, in case people weren't familiar, uh, the actual correct name of, of the virus that's causing this pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. And of course, COVID-19, which is the name of the disease that the virus causes. Uh, so essentially, uh, what the government did was uh, set up a uh, central repository where all of the available literature surrounding these, uh, well, this disease and, and this virus were available. Um, that database contains around 30,000 scientific articles. About half of them are full text. Uh, unfortunately, the other half are largely behind paywalls, so uh, they're not fully available, but they are available um, in terms of their you know, metadata, so title, authors, and their abstract. Um, and all of this data is collected in a machine-readable format, so it's easy to apply uh, machine learning models to it and so forth. Uh, and everyone can just kind of go and download this data set. It's, a, it's around two gigs in size, I believe, and uh, start playing around with it, experimenting and, and seeing what can be done with, I guess, a view that, you know, if we can look at all of the available research that's ever been gathered around uh, this particular disease, this particular strain of coronavirus, as well as the research that's been done on this family of viruses in the past, uh, perhaps there are sort of things in there that, that are uncoverable that the researchers that are, are hardworking on this just wouldn't possibly have the time to uncover because no one can read everything and no one can read everything with the amount of depth and 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 create the kinds of links that are necessary in order to you know potentially find uh, unusual connections within this data. So it was all put together with with this plan to to give AI researchers a starting point and hopefully they can use this data to try to you know solve new problems and and get to some of the the facts behind this this mm -hmm. pandemic. So uh, why can't so why is it that that AI is needed to do this? What is it about AI that makes that, that like how can AI be applied to this Cord nineteen database in order to generate insights? I mean, I guess it just comes down to the fact that there's just straight up too much literature uh, out there. Um, the 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 rate of of scientific discovery is pretty fast, uh, but yet it might feel like our the progress doesn't 
um, doesn't happen the way you want. And from like a layman's perspective, you know, when we talk about scientific progress, we're talking about cures and uh, drugs and vaccines. Uh, from a scientific perspective, progress is, you know, uncovering the minutia of how one viral receptor interacts with one particular uh, cell surface protein. Uh, and so, you know, those tiny little bits of scientific progress are happening all the time uh, and at a quite rapid uh, pace. And indeed, in this particular space around coronavirus and, and the coronavirus family, uh, this has been going on for years. But in order to to kind of come up with some actionable insights out of all of that disparate uh, data, it's necessary to to look at the whole scope of literature that's been published. And it, as I said, that's just too difficult for any one person to do. Um, surely, from a, a, a time in the day perspective, but then also from a mental capacity perspective, it's very difficult to <laughs> ingest that amount of complex data and be able to create those links. Um, over such a vast space. So if we can use AI, AI is particularly adept um, at uncovering patterns and looking for, for links and, and so on. So uh, this could be a really great way of, of creating these links between all these disparate studies and, and potentially having a profound implication for the development of novel antivirals or the understanding of the virus's origin or the understanding of how this virus is spreading out in the real world. Got it. So so in addition to our coordinated global response and, you know, uh, people doing social distancing, um, some uh, governments quarantining folks and, uh, you know, all of these strategies, these social strategies, in addition to those being facilitated in a way by data, um, and by communication over the internet, uh, and and the internet also facilitating people to be to be able to come up with strategies for avoiding getting it themselves. You know, watching videos on YouTube about how to wash their hands properly and that kind of thing. In addition, um, the scientific community is able to leverage our interconnectedness uh, facilitated by technology, and so we're able to pool together all of these common uh, resources, and then. We can use uh, machine learning algorithms, with which lots of, which, which lots of people learn about, um, through free resources that are available online, through uh, GitHub repositories, and these kinds of things. And so, there's a ton of um, open source and uh, and community and collaboration that we're able to do um, as as scientists and maybe even as non scientists over the internet. And that I, that actually brings me to one specific thing um, related to um, to COVID-19 and this CORD-19 data set, uh, uh, from my understanding, and I think you can you can fill in more information on this, the Kaggle platform itself, um, so we talked about Kaggle a lot in our first episode um, of, of this podcast. So Kaggle is a platform that allows people to uh, compete against each other. And so it seems like that particular platform on the internet is also um, getting involved with tackling COVID-19, right? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so the, the data set is actually available to download from Kaggle. That's not necessarily where it's, it's permanently stored, but they've got links, uh, they've got yeah. links to it there. And, um, they also have, uh, a, a list of tasks that have been put together by the national academies and the WHO. Uh, and these are a, a group of tasks that are considered high priority tasks. And the idea is that if we could try to, um, you know, get into the, the nitty gritty of these particular problems that would you know, help the sort of general drive to combat and hopefully defeat this pandemic. And those, those tasks include things like, you know, what's known about transmission, incubation and environmental stability of, of the virus itself, um, or what are particular risk factors for particular people in terms of the severity of the COVID-19 disease um, what do we know about the genetics and the origin and the evolution of this virus? How did it come to be so uh, so dangerous and so easily transmissible when you know coronaviruses in general are sort of everywhere and people are getting them all the time and, and they just cause mild resp respiratory infections and it's kind of just considered a, a cough or a cold? Um, why is this one such a big deal? Um, you know, what do we know about vaccines and therapeutics? So there are a whole, you know, sphere, a, whole, a number of spheres of questions where we can dig in and, and hopefully try to find answers. And those answers, as I say, might exist in that data set. It, 
we just need someone to make all the links and and hopefully pull out the relevant information. Got it. So that's great. So now, so any listeners with experience in machine learning can use this Kaggle competition, and we'll provide links. Um, you know, if if you're if you if you find the blog post about this episode or uh, the YouTube um, page about this episode, you know, we'll include links for anything we mention in the episode, including links to this um, Kaggle competition. And so people with machine learning experience can then use these data, use the Kaggle platform to compete against each other and come up with um, solutions to some of the various aspects related to the novel coronavirus that you just mentioned. But what if you're a listener at home and you don't have any machine learning experience? Maybe you don't write code at all. Is there anything that that listener could do? Um, Yeah, actually there is. Uh, For this one, you actually just need a computer and you could be solving Hmm. a range of other things, not just uh, problems relating to coronavirus, but also cancer and Alzheimer's. So there is a a project called Bolding at Home. It's actually a really, really cool project. Uh, and essentially, it, it aims to look at and model how proteins fold and how they move and interact with each other. So just to like take a step back, I, th- I think we kind of did a bit of this in last week's episode or last time's episode. Uh, but just to kind of go through that very briefly, again, proteins are, are linear chains of chemicals called amino acids. And um, they typically spontaneously fold into much more compact and functional uh, structures. And these are um, usually arranged in particular ways and they move and and interact with each other in particular ways that are important to their function. So these proteins have are, are the basic molecular machines of life. They are enzymes, they are um, structural proteins that build cells. Um, they can be all sorts of different, uh, well, they can have all sorts of different functions in, in every sort of sphere of life. So understanding how they arrange and how they structure and how they move is quite important to understanding their function. So if we know how the proteins work and we know what they're doing, we can then design drugs which potentially interfere with those functions. And in the case of coronavirus, we could design an antiviral that would stop the virus. So this uh, this whole process is what's known as rational drug, drug design. Um, and the, the the approach here was is to um, use computational uh, a, a computational biology approach to try to model the structure of a protein and how it moves um, and <clears throat> get more understanding. But that's a really complex computational problem. Essentially, the folding of the proteins. Oh yeah, and uh, so this this um, study is way more interested in the dynamics of the protein once it's already folded. Um, uh, and so, uh, how does a protein move? How does it change shape? Uh, how does it interact with the various things that it's you know evolved to interact with when it binds to another molecule or another chemical or another protein? How does it change? How does it move? Um, and so those those things are really important. And typically, the way that proteins have been studied in the past is they they haven't really been studied in in this dynamic fashion. We've essentially sort of been taking snapshots of the proteins, kind of like photographs frozen in time. And while it's a great way of seeing the general structure, it really doesn't give you a sense of of how the whole protein is working and how it does its jobs. So what they did, um, what this what this folding at home project aims to do, is take those existing snapshots. And then looking at the full structure of the protein, try to model how every single little atom might move and how that um, might work. And as you can likely imagine, modeling the movement of every single atom inside of a protein is a really, really tricky task. And it, 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 it rapidly explodes into a, a seemingly infinite um, space of possibilities. So using sort of a lot of computational power is really the only way to crack this for now. So because computational power is is scarce in the academic space and expensive, uh, the Folding at Home project is essentially an app that uh, anyone can download and run on their computer. And the second your computer sits idle and, it, and you're not busy with it, so say you've you know gone off to lunch or you're asleep or whatever it may be, uh, the Folding at Home app will spring to life and it'll start to use your computer's uh, CPU cycles to model these um, these interactions, these these protein movements. Um, so it'll download a bit of data from the folding at home um, servers. 
It'll run the computations on your computer and then it'll send the results back. And if we can do wow. this at, on a large enough scale, um, we essentially, you know, across the internet, all the internet interconnected computers, that's the largest supercomputer that there is. If you can, if you can kind of bring together all of those resources. So that's what they've been doing. Right. And it's, it's really cool. That's very cool. So um, we are setting up all of our deep learning servers at Untapped to be able to do that, to do exactly that. Yeah. So um, we've downloaded and are setting up the folding at home software on all of our deep learning servers so that when we are not training models um, that, you know, we're taking advantage, we're joining that giant interconnected yeah. supercomputer. All right. I have it running on a GTX 1080 Ti at home as we speak. Nice. There you go. Um, so while while you're yeah right while you're on this podcast, um, that's amazing. Uh, so are there are there questions from from other co-hosts or Ben or um, you know now you've got you've got a virology expert right here. Um, any, anything that you'd like to ask him or um, is there anything else that I that I missed that you'd like to say, Grant? No, I've, I've got it all covered. No, this is Ben speaking. So I've, I've been fascinated about this topic because I've wondered, is there a way for us to take like an Elon Musk outsider approach and just come in here with a huge cluster, big compute, and just simulate this and optimize it at a whole other scale? Like what is the self-driving discover antibodies for viruses scenario? Is that something that can happen this year or are we still five or 10 years out from the 24-hour simulation to here's your new antibody? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. I, I think that um, if there were a large enough uh, a large enough network and we could bring enough computers together, I think that that is possible. Um, I just think it's very it, it's difficult to I guess it's like a really big problem and it's difficult to wrap our heads around. It. It's kind of like visualizing four or five dimensional space. It's like hard to kind of fathom that that would be possible. But I think that it is possible. I think that we're pretty close to getting to situations like that. Um, one of the, the key issues, right, is uh, you can come up with a simulation to model any kind of system you like, really, uh, as, so long as you aren't constrained by compute power. So let's assume that we aren't constrained by compute power. Uh, you still need to rationally design a good uh, simulation model. You still need to incorporate all of the various um, variables, you still need to um, take account for as many of those possibilities as possible. And I think that that's kind of a difficult um, thing to do still. Um, so yeah, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but it's a great question. I think we are definitely getting closer, but we're still a little ways out. Uh, I was reading a little earlier um, on the topic of prediction um, about the idea of uh, how to predict how to predict the flu season as an example since we're dealing with respiratory viruses each year the flu season is a little different and um, researchers try to sort of game the system and get ahead of that curve and try to predict what kind of flu viruses are going to come out each year and one of the handy things that flu virus prediction has is many many years of flu virus data um, we've got experience on what each of those seasons looks like. With coronavirus, for example, we have nothing. Um, they essentially have to start from, from scratch uh, and just work with no information. And so I think that in a lot of these simulation cases as well, uh, if something is sufficiently new and we don't have any idea of the parameters, the boundaries um, of that simulation, it becomes increasingly more difficult to, to do that. So that's one thing. So predicting epidemiology like that is interesting, but isn't something something that I've been thinking about with with relation to these viruses? And correct me if I'm wrong here, but so viruses tend to have a pretty small amount of genetic information, right? Usually, yeah. And, and and just and I think like the coronavirus, it has like in in one of its forms, it really only has like three functional proteins, and so. It seems like of all of the kinds of, you know, if we were talking about uh, bacteria, there's they are m vastly more complex than a virus, or you know, uh, you know, other kinds of issues that we might face. It, shouldn't it be possible to kind of relatively quickly characterize um, the function of of the relatively small number of proteins, the relatively small amount of genetic material in a virus? 
I guess it's still it's just such a challenging problem that you can't overnight come up with with a way of of, of attacking one of those problems. Well, it goes back to to the original problem, which is to say, yeah, um, viruses do have a very small genome, a small number of genes. In fact, um, usually from a virology perspective, only a couple of those genes are really important to us because some of them are are structural genes, and you know they just create the little like body that the virus lives in when it's outside of the cell. The ones that we're really interested in mm-hmm. are the genes, the, 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 the proteins that allow a virus to stick onto a human cell and then get inside or the right. And maybe, maybe to exactly. And so we can definitely narrow the field yeah. down and pick out just a couple that are interesting to us and that we need. But then further to that, in order to really work on those, we need very, very high quality uh, models on how those look. And so now we're back at folding at home and we're trying to model these um, these proteins and know exactly how they function. Because um, another thing about viruses is, yes, they have a very small genome, but they, they evolve really quickly. Um, and so this novel virus is going to have different proteins to the viruses that we've seen before, albeit very similar, and they have the same function and generalized structure. They'll be just different enough that, you know, a drug that will work on an old coronavirus won't work on this new one or, or something like that. So... Um, it gets really tricky and um, that's when, you know, these kind of moments happen. So if you go to the folding at home website, they've got a whole page now devoted to, to COVID-19 and they're, um, they're really sort of moving or, or I guess giving those coronavirus jobs a really high priority on the system. So more of people's computers out in the world are crunching coronavirus related uh, folding simulations than, you know, anything else. So yeah, we're we're getting there, but it's it's not perfect. I, I don't mean to be hogging the questions. No. I, I have another question. If nobody else has one, if no one else wants to jump in, I, I I've got a quick one. I'll yeah. sneak in. See the other the other question I had was, I know that the moonshot is maybe not practical because the moonshot is here's your vaccine twenty four hours later. Computer told us it was so. That's mm-hmm. the moonshot. But is there a lower? Is there some lower hanging fruit where? I've seen press coming out that the malaria, some one of the drugs for malaria, looks like it's making progress uh, with the coronavirus. But it seems like that should actually just come out of a computer, where it essentially tests the virus against all known, whether you're in the U.S. FDA approved or any known drug or treatment that's been allowed to be injected into humans. It would just immediately do simulated yeah. tests against whether it's thousands or hundreds of thousands. And the computer should have said, you should try the malaria drug. Yeah, um, so I'd be really curious kind of what that scenario looks like, where it's not the moonshot, it's just something maybe a little bit more practical. They definitely are doing that. Um, we did that as part of my uh, my PhD project, in fact. Um, so it's, it's sort of, it's called like in silico docking, I think was the term, if I'm remembering it all correctly. But essentially what you can do is, is take the molecular structure of... Um, a library of known compounds. So typically what people use then is um, a library of all the FDA approved drugs. So these are all the drugs that the FDA has said, you know, these are safe to give to humans. And also they have this other function that is, um, you know, that is used medically. Uh, There's quite a lot of drugs. I couldn't tell you the number off off the top of my head, but um, they'll, they'll run all of those against models of the proteins. And again, you can, fish out things that are likely to bind in various ways to all of those proteins. And then you can kind of go through those. And, and as you say, you can pick out and you say, hey, this, this drug over here that's used to treat this like rare cancer is actually really great against um, COVID-19. That's actually how a lot of the original um, HIV drugs uh, came out. So AZT was the first one. Um, and that was actually a cancer drug prior to it being um, used for HIV. And it wasn't a very good cancer drug. It just, um, it didn't ever really go to market, I don't think. Stand to be corrected on that. Uh, So it can definitely be done in that respect. Again, back to folding at home, the better quality you have um, in terms of of models of the proteins that you're trying to target, the better the system is going to work, the more accurate your your predictions are going to be. And unfortunately, that system is a good approach. It's a good kind of first pass because it's easy. But, uh, you know, it doesn't actually, it's not a very foolproof approach. So what we 
did sort of subsequently to that was we had this now list. Um, I was working myself on um, on influenza virus drugs, and we would then have this list of drugs that are you know a smaller list, and they might work. And subsequently, then we'd have to have to actually go put those drugs into cell culture with human cells and viruses on them and see if it affected the way the viruses grow. Um, and so it, it, it all ends up coming back down to that wet biology, uh, unfortunately. Um, that's the only really sort of almost foolproof way of doing it. It's, you know, that's a whole other bag of chips that we can get into on another podcast entirely. But, uh, but yeah, it's getting there and it's a great idea but it's not perfect. Um, and it's, it, at the moment, it's just used as a first pass to identify potentially interesting compounds. Nice. All right. Well, that was a ton about um, the coronavirus, uh, viruses in general, and how we can use data and machine learning and how you at home, uh, if you have machine learning experience using Kaggle, uh, the COVID-19 related competition, or if you don't have machine learning experience, at least downloading folding at home and taking a crack uh, at letting your computer, it could be your computer that uh, you wouldn't ever know it probably, but your computer could be the one that makes a huge amount of headway in resolving the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So that was super cool. Thank you so much, Grant. We're so lucky to have you uh, as our resident virologist on A4N. Thank You're you so welcome. much. All right, so um, that's the end of our first segment. Up next, we have another health topic, which is completely different and also completely mind-blowing. It is prosthetics that you control with your brain, and those are driven by machine learning as well. So that's coming up next. All right, welcome back to A4N. I hope you enjoyed that detailed segment on the coronavirus. Up next, we're talking about uh, more health news here. This is mind control prosthetics. And so this is interesting because in the US alone, there's nearly 2 million people that have lost a limb and millions more worldwide. Prosthetic limbs that behave in a subtle lifelike way using mind control would make getting around and going about daily activities much easier for any of those millions of people. So cyborg mind-controlled limbs, that sounds a lot like science fiction, but Vince Pitaccio, our co-host of A4N, with both a master's in biomedical engineering, in which he happened to specialize specifically in brain-computer interfaces like these, and also his master's in computer science with an AI specialization that provides him with insight into how machine learning algorithms could improve these mind-controlled limbs, we couldn't have um, a better person on the show to talk about it. So Vince, tell us about this topic. Yeah, so this is actually a really interesting project that comes out of the University of Michigan. Uh, basically, the context for this is, as you said, there are a whole lot of people out there who have limbs that need to be amputated for uh, a wide variety of reasons. And what usually happens when you amputate a limb is you end up with a piece of the nerve that went all the way from the spinal cord out to the end of the limb, say the fingers and the hand, uh, that just has to be cut at some arbitrary point that the surgeon kind of chooses to do that cut. And what can happen is that over time, that end of the nerve, uh, it's not receiving any inputs and the motor nerves don't have anywhere to go. And so the brain is still has, it still has these representations of a limb that no longer exists. And so you can end up with things called phantom limb syndrome, where oh, yeah. uh, you experience pain and sensation in a limb that doesn't actually uh, exist any longer. And over time, the nerves can kind of degrade and just result in kind of generalized pain. Uh, and this kind of opens up a lot of opportunity for kind of taking advantage of those existing nerve fibers and using them to control some sort of prosthetic device. Now, this particular study, there are kind of two innovations, <laughs> innovations, a lot of innovations, two main innovations <laughs> in this case. <laughs> um, the, the real big one here is actually more on the the interface that they made on a hardware level that connects the uh, the nerve to the technology. So just for a little bit of background, some of the existing systems, what they do is they might take the nerve that gets cut and kind of reroute it to a muscle uh, somewhere else in the body and use the nerve to kind of make some muscle, say, in the chest twitch and then record that muscle twitching and use it to control some prosthetic. Um, another uh, solution is 
to stick like a, a cuff electrode around that nerve yeah. or to put a needle inside the nerve. And, and all of those techniques, they work at first, but over time they tend to degrade. Um, you have oh, a really high, man. low signal to noise ratio. Yeah. You so, think they would get better yeah. somehow? I don't know. Like just that, I don't know, by constantly using it, it would cause, you know, neuroplasticity somehow to engage more. But I guess because it's outside of, you know, it's kind of in the peripheral nervous system, I guess there's not really neuroplasticity like there is. Yeah, exactly. And that's the major challenge is it's not an issue of the central nervous system. It's the peripheral nerve that you're, that has just been severed and uh, doesn't have its normal terminate terminal points. And you just are trying to interface with it in some way that's not really um, consistent with how it grew and, uh, you know, just how it evolved in general. So th this, what they use in this study is something called the RPNI, the Regenerative Peripheral Nerve Interface. And the way this one works is they basically take the nerve that was cut, and they can do this years later after there's already been some healing involved, which is pretty interesting to me. Mm. And they'll take a piece of muscle graft. In this study, they used the vastus lateralis, which is a big, long muscle in the thigh. And they basically just wrap that muscle uh, graft like a lollipop or a Q-tip around the end of that nerve. And that allows the nerve to eventually innervate that little ball of muscle. And that doesn't really do much on its own, except occasionally twitch this little ball of muscle, but they've <laughs> implanted small electrodes in the muscle. And so what happens when you, when you move your muscle is there's a nerve impulse that goes through the nerve and transfers to the muscle and then the muscle fibers activate. And so they're basically using these small balls of muscle as amplifiers to amplify these nerve impulses to the point where they can reliably and consistently record those responses with a computer. So yeah. what they can actually do as well is they, they do, uh, they cut the nerve up into individual bundles and kind of splay them out. And then we'll send each one of those bundles. It's called a, a fascicle. Uh, to a separate little muscle graft. So now they have a kind of multi-channel um, set of these balls of muscle graft that they can use to control a multi-channel system. Mm. And so and so this, this gives them a lot of opportunity to, to record raw signals in ways that can be used to control some prosthetic device. And, and so this is where the kind of second innovation ties in here. And this innovation is the use of some machine learning algorithms that allow them to, to really get some nuanced control signals out of these, uh, these muscle grafts. So they have two approaches that they mentioned in the study. The first is a naive Bayes classifier. And so in this situation, they're basically looking for, uh, from what I can tell from the uh, from the article about this, uh, it's basically a binary classifier. And what they do is they record 50 millisecond windows of activity from those little muscle grafts, and they take the mean absolute value of the EMG or muscle electrical muscle activity uh, over that 50 millisecond time window. And th that that actual uh, that value, which is just a float value from that 50 millisecond window, becomes a feature to a naive Bayes classifier. Got it. And so what they do is at training time, they have the subject or the patient just imagine making a fist or try to, to make a fist. Ah. And so you end up with these nerve impulses coming down the nerve into those little muscle grafts and they record those 50 millisecond time windows over and over and over in that time that the, the person is, is imagining making a fist. Wow. And so you can do this for a few minutes and you'll have many, many, many thousands of training examples. Huh. And then you can just in a couple clicks uh, in the same day, in the same session, uh, use that to quickly train a naive Bayes classifier, which are, are generally extremely quick to train. And, uh, and then immediately start using the prosthetic right there and then. Wow. Um, it's pretty cool. And, and so you would train like one action at a time, like you would train like, hey, you know, for the next five minutes, we're just going to do making a fist. And then we'll do five minutes after that, we'll do like pointing your index finger or something like that. Yeah, exactly. There's a whole range of activities that they gave them. I used the example of making a fist and, and you gave another one of pointing, but they also do things like uh, like touching your forefinger to your thumb or your middle finger to your thumb, uh, giving a thumbs up. Um, all kinds of things like that, so they can get different uh, different uh, features or different uh, training labels, basically, uh, and then train that classifier to identify what uh, pose the the user is trying to make. 
Um, another algorithm they've tried and they describe in this uh, paper is a Kalman filter. A Kalman filter is an optimal estimation algorithm. And basically, it's a way to, in a control system, to try to predict some parameter in a noisy environment using indirect measurements. And kind of one of the canonical examples is, you know, you're trying to figure out uh, when to turn a, a hydrogen powered rocket engine on and off, because if you leave it on too long, you can melt the engine components. But if you don't keep it on, you the rocket can stop moving or fall out of the sky. And you can't measure the temperature from inside the rocket engine. You can only measure it from outside of the engine. So um, this is another example here where it's a very noisy environment and you're using very indirect measurements. Here, they're measuring um, the muscle activity from these different balls of muscle. And they're trying to actually predict the correct pose of a prosthetic limb. Right. Uh, and so using this, um, this Kalman filter, they're actually able to produce a, a wa much wider variety of more nuanced and complex movements than the naive Bayes classifier. Yeah, I understand. We used to try to, when I used to trade at a hedge fund, we used to use Kalman filters to try to predict like whether we were in like a bear market or a bull market with like a particular asset or, you know, something like that, we, you know, these kind of regime changes. And so I can see how that would be like you're predicting when you flipped from wanting to have a particular hand gesture to another one. That's cool. Sorry, I spoke yeah. you. Oh, no, not at all. I, I was just going to say that what I think would be really interesting to explore in these types of problems is, you know, my background in brain computer interfaces was not so much controlling prosthetic limbs, but allowing users who were locked in, uh, we worked with ALS patients uh, primarily, to control a computer in a way that allowed them to communicate. So we would just be recording neural signals while they looked at a computer monitor. And our goal was to try to figure out, you know, what letter are they trying to type out on a computer? And what we found is that over time, you have this kind of multi-agent uh, game model that happens where the, the system, our brain-computer interface system, is trying to learn how to interpret the user's neural signals. But at the same time, the user's brain is incorporating this new device as though it's an, a new limb. And so you have two systems simultaneously learning uh, in a cooperative way at the same time. But um, for each one of them, it, it doesn't necessarily feel cooperative because the other system is changing while it's trying to learn it. Right. So I would be really interested in the future to see some reinforcement learning algorithms that, that kind of are designed for this sort of multi-agent game uh, type of model Whoa. applied to these sorts of problems. That's super cool. And so Ben, uh, we were talking earlier today, you mentioned that you recently met someone uh, who was using devices like these. Do you want to tell us about him? Yeah, so so this guy, his name is Gabe Adams. He's an inspirational speaker. He actually has no limbs, so he's not currently using these devices. You can look out to um, if if listeners are interested. You can find him on Twitter. Yeah, no well, and, underscore limbs, and, and we'll provide yeah, a link so he, to the YouTube video yeah. that you mentioned as well in the show notes. Yeah, so he potentially someone like that in the future could have access to something like this where. He has no limbs and he could, you know, get mobility. He's he's actually an inspirational speaker because he's surprisingly mobile today. So he's able to do a lot of things that should be impossible. He can dress himself, feed himself, do all these things. The thing that we were talking about was how can how can AI if it's kind of a you know you know, what do you want? How 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 could AI make his, his life better? It involves a lot more beyond just the limb replacement, it a lot of its voice activation. You know, can AI assist with opening doors? Can a can he program with his voice? Stuff like that. And so that it was more blue sky conversations. But I'm right. I'm hoping in the next year or two we find an opportunity to work together and do something that's exciting and inspiring. But yeah, I'm very interested in the stuff that um, Vince is talking about. Wow. Yeah, that's cool. Um. So, and if there aren't any other questions, I have I have just one more. So there's uh, I've read a lot. Vince in the last couple of years about Elon Musk, you know, and he's come up a couple of times in this podcast um, about Elon <laughs> Musk's Neuralink project, which is a project designed to, to it's a brain control interface project um, where, you know, he, he thinks, and I, I think it's probably an inevitability some way or another where we're connecting directly between our brains and the internet. And we're kind of connected in that way. And so how does this kind of stuff, this mind control prosthesis 
relate to that work? Yeah, so whenever the subject of brain computer interfaces come up, it's it's inevitable that uh, someone will will kind of reference something like the matrix where um, you know, an operator can pop a floppy disk, uh, for some reason they were still using floppy disks, um, mm -hmm. into a drive and upload instructions on how to fly a helicopter into somebody's brain or uh, teach them kung fu by just uploading data directly into their brain. And I think that's uh, that kind of level of depth of interconnection between computing systems and biological brains is kind of the inspira inspiration behind uh, the Neuralink project. And I, I'm, I'm skeptical. I, I will never say that anything's impossible because I don't know what the future is. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it seems unlikely to me, and here's why. I think that we have, over the last few decades, actually pretty well optimized our interfaces with computers. Right. Uh, we evolved in a, in a regime where we had to learn to communicate as efficiently as possible with other humans uh, because that benefited our evolutionary ancestors. We also uh, evolved nervous systems that are really good at telling where telling where our limbs are in space and being able to identify what things feel like and interact with the physical world. So things like mice for computers and keyboards and uh, to an extent voice control interfaces, these I think are the optimal channels for getting information into and out of the brain. It, to suggest that a brain computer interface could be, you know, an electrode that's like a, a grain of rice that you kind of like stick under your skin behind your ear that could somehow have a more efficient uh, means of access to information in the brain suggests that there's a lot of low hanging fruit in terms of how information gets in and out of the brain. Uh -huh. And I don't necessarily know that's the case. And just on a technical level, something like a brain computer interface, I think. Th viewing that as something that could be small and just implanted in one spot, it, I think s kind of misunderstands the way that the brain works. Uh, right. We still have a lot to learn about the brain, but so much of what the brain does is distributed across the entire organ. You know, right. um, just having one memory can involve everything from motor systems to sensory systems to vision to all the different parts of your brain. And if you really want to have that sort of deep, interactive connection with neural systems, then you would have to be directly tapping into neural signals throughout the entire brain. And I used to actually work, I worked about seven years in brain and spine surgery, and I have never met a spine surgeon or a brain surgeon who would ever uh, crack your skull open to implant a, a big electrode net over your, right, over right, your entire right. brain surface um, for this type of procedure, yeah. nor have I ever met a patient who would want it. So I, I just don't know that it's likely um, in uh, the foreseeable future. Yeah, I like one thing that I find really interesting about this idea is that um, let's say that in 20 years, this Neuralink project is super successful. They come up with a way of somehow non-invasively having a mesh go like through your, like around a hole around your eye or something. And it like gets implanted in your brain and it covers your whole brain. And it's really effective at accessing the internet. Like somehow we managed to get this to work. And then um, two years later, they're like, oh man, we just came up with like a way better way of doing it. And we're going to need to like, but you can't get like the old way out. Cause it's like this like mesh on your brain. <laughs> so they, then they like insert, they try to like insert another one. And this is like every couple of years, it's like the like uh, Apple iPhone uh, program. Like I'm on the program where I get a new iPhone every year. So I'm going to have to like every year get a new like mesh implanted up my eye or in my <laughs> nose. And it kind of like, there's just all these meshes getting stuck in there. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely have enough cobwebs in my brain as it is, um, but uh, yeah, I can definitely see that being an issue. Um, you know, I think a big part of this as well, like as you said, I, I can imagine, let's say we get around the technical challenge of getting something into the skull. Well, that's still only going to get us that outer surface of the brain and, and that part, which we kind of call the neocortex um, because of its right, evolutionary age, right, it's the right, newest right, part right. of our brain is really directly tied to our consciousness and our cognition, but it doesn't tie into things like emotion, right. which play a big role in how our brain works. And one final word on this that makes me even more skeptical is that the brain works by changing itself. It has to change itself. There's a fantastic book on this by Dr. Neumann Deutsch called The Brain That Changes Itself, and it totally changed the way I thought about brains. And they're, they're plastic. They change over time. You cannot learn without your brain physically changing. 
And in order to learn, you have to forget some things and you have to restructure your brain. So any system that relies on physical interactivity with direct neurons mm. will immediately become deprecated the moment you learn something or forget something, mm. uh, which happens many times every single day. So I think there, there are major challenges to this, maybe insurmountable fundamental challenges. Vince, I stopped learning years ago, but whatever. Um, uh, <laughs> all right. So we've gone over on this segment. Uh, uh, I, I loved, I love talking about this. It, it, it went on longer than, than I intended, but I just couldn't resist asking more questions. This was such a fascinating topic. All right. So we've got, uh, we went on, uh, we talked about the coronavirus for so long. Uh, we only have one more topic left to cover and it's really exciting. It is not in healthcare, but it is about how AI based startups today are so vastly different from the other kinds of startups that VCs were uh, investing in historically. And um, we're, we've got more on that coming right up. Oh, man, that was great, Vince. Oh, thanks. Sorry, I went a little over time. It's okay. I let you. It also tied back to the beginning when we were talking about simulations, because first you have chemical simulation, protein simulation, cell simulation, organism simulation, where somewhere in the future, maybe we're not alive, we're doing organism simulation, and you're actually simulating, you know, what is the brain IQ based on these, you know, these gene sequence. And I, and I know that's like total moonshot. We'll probably never live to see that. But theoretically, maybe that's possible. And we're definitely going to see human engineering. Like we're already seeing it with the Chinese use case. <laughs> We'd also have to solve the nature versus nurture problem. <laughs> How much of a, a brain is, is just the, the sum of the experiences that brain has had in its lifetime, you know, post, uh, what's the womb post postnatal. <laughs> yeah. And you, you hit the nail on the head because it all comes back to you have to simulate their environment and now we're all in a, in a simulation. <laughs> that proves it. Yeah, that proves it. Fact. <laughs> you, you know, this, this was discussed on a podcast a thousand years ago. Fact. <laughs> Our final topic for today brought to us by Andrew, who has been a software developer and data scientist at data-focused businesses, mostly in the financial industry for over 20 years is on the differences between the AI startups often invested in by venture capitalists today relative to the software as a service tech startups that were the most popular investment category until recently. So we're talking about this because the prominent hedge, uh, prominent venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz uh, recently published a blog post on this where they suggested that there are three main issues facing AI companies today. Andrew, could you tell us about that? Sure, John. Uh, it's actually a great blog post. I, I, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, um, but it was quite interesting to hear their take on on how they value uh, startups in general and then AI startups specifically. Um, the idea of a, of a software uh, driven, like a software as a service startup, um, gets a lot of valuation given the fact that uh, that costs are, are are usually pretty low and they have a high uh, custom margin, a large a large gross margin. Um, especially now with the cloud, uh, you can spin up a, an idea for a software as a service in, in hours, um, given how many tools and stuff that are out there and then sell it to as many people as you can. So, uh, you get a high valuation from that perspective. And in this blog post, they sort of, uh, uh, compare that with AI businesses that, um, are a little bit more, uh, obviously data intensive and then, uh, compute intensive. So that margin um, decreases, and uh, and you really have to take care of them or value them a little bit differently because of that. Right, 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 right. So we have lower lower margins due to uh, heavy cloud infrastructure usage, uh, and then there's other issues as well, right? With uh, you know scaling challenges, you have you know you build your machine learning algorithm, and it works in a bunch of cases. You know it works in 90% of cases. Well, guess what? That's a huge number of cases that are that are challenging and are requ going to require uh, typically expensive data scientists to tackle these things. Right. So your your margin is 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 uh, degraded by uh, needing humans to constantly look at the model to try to capture what the edge cases are once you get the the model into production. Um, uh. I mean, it's very different from. Uh, knowing that what you want your software to do and writing the 10 heuristic rules. And then once you code them, you're pretty confident that you've covered, uh, you know, the, the edge cases with it, you can kind of put that live and, and, and until you change something that, that most of the time that functionality is going to 
continue uh, with with uh, machine learning models, obviously a lot of things can change um, and you have to keep an eye on it. And then the third thing they mentioned um, is sort of this uh, this concept of a, a weaker defensive moat. So a moat is uh, this financial term that's come up, I don't know, in the last five years maybe about uh, mm -hmm. how well protected is your revenue stream from other competitors in the business. So the wider the moat, think of it as a castle, the more protection I have that right. to, uh, some new company is not going to come and, and take away all my revenues. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea is that AI actually has weaker defensive moats, um, maybe because there's so much commoditization of, of AI at the moment. So where it used to be, you needed somebody that knew um, the, deep uh, the deep weeds of the of mathematical model to build your neural net and deploy it in some... Uh, performance C++ version, now you can kind of just throw up your features into a, a Google platform and, and let it sort of uh, iterate over the different hyperparameters and you have a model and that works somewhat decently. So uh, so there's, there's some of that and then there's some uh, concepts around uh, data network effects um, where you, just because you have the, your data is driving your model, um, that data can become stale, uh, it can become uh, cost prohibitive to acquire new data that's not really adding value mm. to your to your model so um, those are the three sort of things that they've outlined as uh, differences in in AI software startups so lower gross margins scaling challenges and then weaker defensive modes right well so Ben how you know is there anything else you think they're, they're missing or how do we get around these issues how does someone like yourself build a successful AI business? Yeah, I, I love this topic. And I, I think like you said before we started, we could talk about this for mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours. The funny thing, so I've been three years into the startup. And the funny thing about doing a startup and actually getting pounds of scar tissue all over your face <laughs> and on your shoulders is if you could go back in time and talk to yourself three years ago pitching VCs, you'd want to punch <laughs> yourself in the neck because you don't know you don't know anything. And, and all these things resonate. And one of the things I was going to throw on there was with SaaS, you get this, and it's not just SaaS, it's just software. You get the multiplier effect where you have like the React Twitter clone. And so if I told you 15 years ago, I was going to build this Twitter e ecosystem, that'd be very daunting and intimidating. But today with serverless, Docker, Kubernetes, these wonderful languages, you can do stuff like, you know, go back in time a decade and you would blow the socks off people what you can do in 24 hours but speaking about ai one of the things we talk about is your model building a model is not it's not your ip it's not it's not com a competitive advantage your data is your ip right. so if you can get access to some unique data sets that can become a significant moat where it, it's not a script kitty away and what i mean by that it's not like a tensorflow blog post away right. from imitating your business and we talk a lot about that. Yeah, oh, that's sorry. a really good point. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, even a lot of the biggest companies will open source their models um, and even their tools for building AI systems. But the most successful AI companies out there, they do not let you get access to their data. That's for sure. Yeah. And, it, and there's a general, con it, it's, it's really surprising to me how bad AI companies are failing in this Hopefully this doesn't come across as arrogant because I just admitted I was an idiot, like a major idiot years ago. But not like anymore. This has been three, three years from now, you'll look back and say, yeah, yeah, I had it all back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of my good ideas are stolen. <laughs> so all of my good ideas I've taken from, I've taken from customers not paying us or like, well, whatever. Um, I love this. But like, yeah, there's a lot of confusion around how do you build a successful AI company and a lot of people, they chase, AI is the shiny tool. So imagine me going into a prospect. Hey, do you guys want to go into business? Yes, we do. What do you want to do? Let's do an attribute model. What are we going to do? We're going to look at an image and say socks, sweater. And I think for a new founder, they're going to run down that vein. But for a seasoned founder with scar tissue, they're going to hold up the stop sign immediately. And they're going to say, we're not working on that problem. But the underlying truth is, what is it worth? Predicting a swimming pool from space for an insurance company, what is that worth? The joke is it's worth more than zero. 
But if you get into these other problems, you can find AI problems that are worth amazing amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars. I would argue in petroleum and oil and gas discovery, you could be looking at a $40 million SaaS contract if you can find the right problem. And so I'm not saying I've found those problems, but it changes your perspective. Hunt for value. AI is a shiny toy. Everyone wants it. And that's a very dangerous thing. Yeah, that is really good. Hey, Vince, you you really want to be exploiting petroleum, right? You want to? That, wanna... That's not funny. <laughs> not funny. Um, I thought. <laughs> At what cost? I thought you forty million dollars is. Uh, it's not worth it when you're destroying the planet no, for future you're generations. You're always. Say. You're always saying coal is the future. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> uh, don't, don't you want to run your droids on coal? Uh, um, the dirtier they get, the better they'll run. Um, yeah, no, I, um, you know, that's a very, I mean, so actually that's a really good, you know, another way of, of kind of spinning that is, um, you know, I, I, you know, there's a lot of value in a lot of energy sources. Um, that's actually something I, I hadn't thought about. And, and even in, in solar or wind or other renewable sources, um, ways that may be actually tying back to um, our, our discussion of viruses in the first segment of this program you could imagine using machine learning on on a particular proprietary data sets for you know a solar or a wind manufacturer to devise ways that um, the that the that the panels or that the uh, you know the turbines could be designed in a way um, that is that much more efficient and you can extract you know you can get that kind of incremental value out of out of the system there's a lot yeah I, it, it's a really good way of approaching problems um, and uh, so I guess that's exactly, so that's what you'll be thinking with your next company, I guess, is, you know, where, where, where are the values, where are the, where are the million dollar contracts? Yeah, well, and it's a little different than that because for my next company, which won't be for a while, like four or five years, <clears throat> or, or maybe never, but I, I think I'll right. get the itch again to go do it again. But for the next company, I love the idea of developing a product backwards because I don't really value opinions, including my own. And this even includes customers. So if I'm talking to a customer, hey, what do you want? What do you want me to do? I don't really value their opinion. I value their behavior. I want to measure their behavior. What do you mean? Sorry, I've got a kid that's knocking. I'll try to get the point across, then you guys can chew on it. So the idea is if I'm building AI for engineers and engineers say, this is great. We really like this. These APIs make sense. I would rather measure the engineer's behavior. So you and I would decide ahead of time. If this is really amazing, what should the engineers be able to do? There's um, there's a very scary thing that happens in software, and that's called the recipe playbook mm -hmm. or the template repeat. So if I'm doing cloud, if I if you're cloud certified for Amazon or cloud certified for Google, I actually have no confidence that you can solve my problem because my problem's new. You re repeating a recipe or repeating a template is not a sign that you've learned something, and so. When it comes to building a product or building an API, you really want something with grassroots, grassroots adoption where you see intrinsic motivation for them to show behavior, share the product. Yeah. yeah Does that make yeah. sense? You're, you're really looking at behavior. Like it, and the funny thing with that is you don't even have to build a product. You can build it backwards. You can do mocks. You can come with a PowerPoint. You can do a play-by-play -play scenario and try to show the behavior. So, yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah, so really. There. Really, actions speak louder than their words. If if they're not using it and buying it, it doesn't matter how much they love it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, it sounded like Ben was dealing with um, with uh, with with kids showing up in his recording studio. Um, so the beauties of recording remotely. Um, uh, Andrew, do you want to run us through quickly um, the kind of the six solutions that Anderson Horowitz, uh, recommended, and we can use that as kind of, uh, our endpoint for this program. Absolutely. Um, so the six things they went to real quick, um, uh, eliminate model complexity, uh, so that, uh, you know, you need to build this trade off between whether you're doing custom model builds for all your clients versus you having one complex model that you expect everybody to use. Uh, the second one was, um, choose your domains very carefully, kind of what Ben was talking about. Uh, it was really, actually, they were they were stressing, like, uh, solve the narrow problem. Um, 
focus on high scale and low complexity problems. So you don't run into the right. edge case issues. Uh, the third one was plan for high variable costs. Uh, treat maintenance of the model as sort of your first order problem. You must uh, account for that in your in your budget. Uh, embrace services. Uh, so you know, you guys know that we've always um, try to balance uh, custom service work versus uh, product work. They said embrace it to learn your customers, but uh, pursue one strategy in a very committed way. Uh, plan for change and tech stack. To me, that just sounds like an obvious uh, thing to do for right, any software right, firm, right. but um, right, in AI, right, right. I don't know. I mean, we yeah. still use COBOL, so <laughs> in your in your gas and oil well, right? Uh, so, <laughs> but plan for change in tech stack, especially around AI, because uh, it's it's definitely still in infancy. There's so much out there, but you have to remember that some of this stuff is five, ten years old at the at the most. Um, and then they they talk about building defensibility in the old fashioned way, build good products, get proprietary data that only you have. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna be the selling point on your product. So the the sixth thing. Right, right, right. Exactly as Ben was saying. All right, so yeah, go ahead. I, I was gonna, oh sorry. I was gonna add real quick. I loved what you said, Andrew. New founders, they get very ambitious that we're gonna build a platform and they, they go after all multiple industries and the VCs are always saying focus on one thing, focus on one vertical. And and even if you think you have a platform or even if you think you have a wide product, if you have to come up with a different sales stack for like every sales meeting, that's that's a waste of time, but it all, you also don't understand your prospect and you don't understand their problem. So something I talk a lot about is find me a problem with a customer behind a customer, behind a customer, behind a customer, where there's actually this sense of momentum. And so I think in the future, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if I ever do another startup, I'll actually just grab five customers immediately and they don't even have to pay me. I don't even care if they pay me for a year. I will be hip to hip with them, take them out to drinks, take them out to dinner. I will just fix their problems for a year, but they will be big companies like Oracle, Amazon, whoever they are. And, and I'll just do, you know, that five customers is huge, but I think young founders don't, they don't think about that because they want to take over the world. They've got a billion dollar startup. Everyone has those ambitions. So I, I loved what you said, Andrew. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Um, so it's been wonderful having you on the show, Ben. Uh, you had a lot uh, to add. And it's too bad that we couldn't get you uh, in person uh, last week, and you know that uh, you know this this Corona the social dist distancing situation, um, you know, not ideal. But we made the most of it here, and we're lucky to be able to to have you call in then from Utah. And actually, because of the way that we're currently under lockdown, even in New York, everyone on the program today, all of the Untapped co-hosts, we're having to call in. Uh, we do intend on having this podcast. Uh, be you know continue to be in the future as soon as as soon as we can be together physically again we will have uh, we will go back to recording live and having that nice video feed for all of you to watch if you're interested in that um, and uh, yeah so thank you very much for joining in today's program we talked about how data and machine learning are leading the fight against COVID-19 so that we can get back to recording uh, live broadcasts <laughs> and how you can help whether you write software or not. If there's one takeaway from today's podcast, it should be that uh, you should download the folding at home software so that your computer can make strides against the coronavirus while you sleep. We also talked about mind control prosthetics powered by machine learning and how AI businesses differ from the tech startups that predominated yesterday. So uh, please do uh, like, subscribe, and follow our podcast. We're across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and we also um, will we provide video content on YouTube, although I guess for this episode, it's going to be a relatively static uh, YouTube experience. Uh, and then we also, a few of us have uh, handles for reaching out to us. Um, for me, for Twitter, I'm John Crone Learns. Um, Grant, do you want to give us your Twitter handle for in case people have uh, ML applied to virology questions? Sure, uh, it's Grant B E Y. Great, and I suspect Ben, you must have a Twitter handle. Yeah, it's Ben Taylor Data. That's also my LinkedIn handle. If you send me a message on Twitter, 
and might respond <laughs> a month later. LinkedIn, yeah, I'm pretty active. Yeah, it's interesting. And we ben were talking Taylor about that earlier on the program that really for what we do in software development and data science, it's interesting how rich the LinkedIn um, experience can be in that statement as a testament to it. Um, yeah, and um, feel free to uh, sign up. Um, I have an email newsletter at my website, johncrohn.com, J-O-N-K-R-O-H-N.com. Um, there's an email newsletter. We put, I, I post every podcast as well as other video tutorials and such that I publish, which are all free. And do feel free to add uh, any of us on LinkedIn. Uh, we'd love to talk to you there. Uh, many thanks to Untapped for bringing us together um, as a company, to Songbin and Maria, who produced the show. And of course, to our guest, Ben Taylor, thank you very much for being on the show. It's really been wonderful. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, thanks ben. ben. See you soon. Yeah, it's been really fun.